Good evening, everybody. Salamat u Ramadan Kareem to everybody who is celebrating Ramadan this month. Uh, we are very excited to be hosting our very first virtual Ramadan event. As many of you are already familiar with FAM, you know that we are known for our dynamic response. And not to be outdone, we have decided to bring community and connection virtually during this holy month. I thank you all for spending your evening with us or your day with us, depending where you are. And it is very exciting to have an event that is connecting people and friends of Sam from all over the world. I'm very excited for the panel that we have tonight are coming from across the United States. And we have two honored guests that are coming from the Middle East. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our very first speaker, uh, President of SAM, of the Syrian American Medical Society, coming to you from Chicago, Dr. Mufaddal Hamada. Thank you, Lara, and happy Ramadan, everybody. It's almost over, seven more days left. Uh, and um, I'm gonna be very brief because I have five minutes. I'll try to stick with my time. Um, uh, the title of this webinar is uh, cry, you know, how do we connect in the time of crises? And I couldn't help but smile when I heard that word crises, because that's what Sam has been dealing with for the last nine years, nothing but crises. Uh, as a matter of fact, since 2011, we've been undergoing going crisis after crisis. And uh, some of these crises that we went through uh, includes the siege and, and starvation of Madaya, where we we, you know, we, we put in a tremendous effort to make sure that we get meals to the people of Madaya during that siege. Uh, the siege and evacuation of Aleppo, the siege and evacuation of Ghouta, uh, followed by Dara, and uh, the chemical weapon attacks and our hard work in advocating for uh, the protection of uh, healthcare workers, hospitals, and clinics, the attacks on our hospitals and clinics, totally over 850 since uh, 2011, uh, and the situation in Idlib just before uh, COVID started, but before the, the siege fire, the ceasefire in, in Idlib, where we have almost a, a million and a half of uh, displaced people and uh, four million people under siege and under constant attacks with daily casualties and attacks on hospitals and clinics, the closure of different hospitals and clinics that we had, and the and relocation of these finances, crisis after crisis after crisis. SAM has been led over the last nine years by very dedicated people, you know, a, a dedicated leadership that is very hard to find uh, a, a, an equal to in any other organization. People like Zahir Sahlul, uh, Ahmed Taraji, Amjad Ras, Majid Isrib, uh, Basil Termimini, Arif uh, Qal'i, all these were the uh, foundation chairs and past presidents that work very, very hard to make sure that we go through these crises and we keep on providing services to people in need. As a matter of fact, last year we provided 2.4 million uh, services, an average of almost 2.5 million services a year for the last 10 years. So that's really amazing. These are crises that we're going through one after another. Eventually you get tired of it. Eventually you get fatigue and, and 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 I always ask my mind myself is where do we get the inspiration to keep on working through these crises how do we keep on doing it how do we keep on working hard and and how do we, our members keep on coming back to sands giving and, and donating and and actually fundraising and and volunteering for sands so the, the the answer to that is basically in in, in continued you know we get that inspiration from the people on the ground, doctors like Farida and Ikram, uh, doctors on the field that sacrifice their lives in order to keep on giving uh, to people in the communities, people who risk their lives every day. We, we, we get the, the, this actually uh, inspiration from basically being involved with SAMS, volunteering on missions. And actually, as you, if you look around, you see the people who donate the most are the people who are actually involved in those stands and volunteer year after year, year after year. We get that inspiration from, you know, the patients we see on the grounds, from that five-year-old boy who was diagnosed on one of the missions that has having 
uh, in fact, to, into cardiac He goes into surgery, and, 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 and his life is saved. From that woman who comes into the clinic, you know, after every rejected by everybody, and, and, and with a leukemia, and we we were able to diagnose her and treat her and, and put her in remission. From that other patient, that, that three-year-old who accidentally was discovered on one of our missions, that are having a, a, congen, a, con, a, a congenital heart block, and, and was referred to surgery, and her life was saved. These are the things that we what makes us really inspired and make us go through all of these things. Uh, so, despite the enormity of the task we have ahead of us, where SAMS is not going to be able to cure everybody, we're not going to be able to treat everybody. Just like in our missions, we have to leave some patients behind. Just like we have to do, uh, keep on. You know, we we realize that despite our efforts, we have very limited resources. And we, we'd like to extend our resources as much as we can. But if you're not there, you're not going to have that opportunity to save these people. If you're not there, you're not going to have that opportunity to put yourself in a position where you're going to be able to help those people. And uh, as uh, you know, in Arabic, we say, <laughs> So when you try, God is also going to be with you and he will help you all along. And, and just to piggyback on this, you know, idea. I just want to mention a very small story on how I got involved with SANS and how I got my inspiration to continue with SANS. In 2013, it was my first mission ever to, to Syria. We were in Bab el Hawa Hospital. Now, Bab el Hawa Hospital, uh, we arrived there, a team of eight uh, guys from Chicago, and uh, they were, we were told that we arrived there about 9 a.m. We were told that 11 a.m. we were received some casualties from a battle nearby. Well, they, that was true. Actually, 11 a.m. we've seen the people coming in, three or four casualties. They're in the emergency room. My team started working on some of them. And I actually was in shock. I mean, honestly, to be honest with you, I felt that, what am I doing here? I'm an oncologist. I'm, I, you know, I don't know how to treat shrapnel wounds, and I don't know how to deal with blood. I, I felt I actually, at that point, powerless and useless. So I said, well, let, let me pretend I'm doing something. I started a conversation with the guy on the next cubicle. It turned out he's a, a young guy who uh, was 22. He came in with an auto accident last night, and he's been under observation. So everybody is busy treating the casualties, and this guy is for gun. And I'm, only one, I'm the only one talking to him. He told me that he had a car accident. They're observing him. They want to send him home. But he said, doctor, I don't feel good. I'm, I'm having pain on the left, you know, on my abdomen. You know, I use my clinical eye and I, but this guy looks shocky. So I actually checked his blood pressure. His blood pressure is 70. He's low. His heart rate is high. I called the, the, the uh, uh, x-ray tech. He immediately done an ultrasound on his abdomen. He's a ruptured spleen. So before they took those guys who had injuries, to the OR to deal with them. They took this guy to the emergency room and his life was safe. So that taught me that if I wasn't there in that particular day, in that particular mission, I would not able, I wasn't able to save that guy. So this is where we are right now is we have a lot of work ahead of us that we have to be there in order to help these people. Thank you. Now I'm gonna introduce uh, my uh, colleague and uh, mentor, Mahir uh, Azuz, who is uh, the foundation chair, and he will uh, give us a few words, and then he will uh, introduce a, a video to, that summarizes Sam's work. Go ahead. Uh. Thank you, Mufadda. Uh, I want to thank all our staff, uh, but more importantly, I want to thank everyone who's attending today and who's watching us through the different uh, streaming uh, methods that we have for this uh, webinar. Uh, if there is uh, one lesson that we've learned from uh, the corona pandemic uh, or crisis, whatever Dr. Father wants to call it, uh, it is that uh, you know, uh, nothing can stop us. Uh, we have been doing very well when it comes to SANS, our members' involvement. Uh, we're very proud of uh, all of your contribution and commitment uh, to SANS. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, to start, uh, I'm going to ask you to do more, just like we've been doing, and you've been hearing me for the last almost 10 years now for every meeting and every event, asking for more. And if there is uh, any time that we need your support more, it is now. Uh, imagine how much this has impacted each one of us. It has impacted 
be disprivileged a lot, lot more. Even here, we are seeing how the disparity in services in healthcare is one of the things that was highlighted by this pandemic. If I take one thing from this pandemic uh, as a lesson, it is that uh, everything that we do has been highlighted within this pandemic. If this pandemic has taught us anything, it is the importance for caring for others, the importance for serving others, the importance of putting others ahead of you, which is what we have been uh, doing. We know that when you wear a mask in public, you're doing it not to protect yourself, but more to protect others. When you're taking precautions, you're doing it to protect others around you. When we are as physicians in the hospitals, we're doing it to protect others. And if this is uh, a very timely banner for this lesson, this is what Ramadan teaches us, to feel for others and put others ahead of you. And this pandemic came in to show the best out of us. And we, uh, thanks God, have uh, seen the best out of each one of you. When it comes to uh, SANS activities now, obviously we have transitioned and we have to adapt. And that is one of the things that we've done, like Dr. Mufaddal said, over the past nine, eight years that we've been uh, active. Uh, we've in constant adaptation and change so that we can accommodate the changing circumstances on the ground. And uh, this is uh, just another challenge. Uh, but uh, to uh, be uh, very specific, uh, you know, what put SANS ahead or different than anybody else is the fact that we do comprehensive approach to our management, to our projects. And we can only do this because of your support, because of the support of every individual uh, that has supported SAM over the eight years. We could not have done this without you. Uh, if SAMS was going to rely only on um, governmental support, on grants, or without our generous donors, and I'm not talking financially only. There were a lot of gaps. There were a lot of limitations. When SAMS approaches a project, we deliver the whole service. There are things that are not covered by grant. There are expertise that are not available on the ground. We can fill these gaps through your generous donations, uh, through your contribution to the organization, through your expertise that you lend to the organization. And if there is any time that support in expertise, manpower, opinions, uh, even emotional support, this is the time to do it. With that, I'm going to let you, uh, uh, instead of uh, the two of us talking about what we do, we put it together in a quick video that's going to show you what we do across the globe, uh, knowing that our services do span from the U.S. to uh, obviously Syria, Turkey, Jordan, Iraq, Lebanon, Greece, Bangladesh, and a few other places that we have contributed uh, to. So here, here it is. SAMS continues to have a major impact on the ground and in the surrounding countries. The needs inside Syria are obviously tremendous. You're talking about a conflict that's going into its ninth year now. The ongoing crisis has created circumstances of chronic diseases, chronic conditions that need to be addressed. SANS had in 2019 a significant medical relief to the about three and a half million peoples inside the Idlib province. The suffering of the Syrian people hasn't been any greater than it is right now. continue to be very strong and, and very active in, in medical missions. We are now continuing to be very persistent 
in our delivering of care. We are most proud of our courageous members across the U.S. who are on the front line of COVID-19 and all frontline medical workers across the globe. I want to thank you, Dr. Hamada and Dr. Azuz, for your continued and inspiring leadership uh, throughout this crisis um, and for your ongoing support in helping us to continue to connect regardless of what's happening. I'd like to also invite you all to take a look at a campaign, our Stand With Idlib campaign has been an ongoing effort that was uh, inspired and began in support of the escalating situation in Idlib uh, in late 2019. And if you are so inspired to, I would encourage you to use the text to donate option to uh, make a donation. You could text stand with Idlib, all is one word, to 71777 to donate. Also throughout this evening, I wanna encourage you to connect with like-minded friends and big-hearted supporters of SAMS through the chat wherever you're joining us tonight. If you're on Zoom, if you're on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube, our staff is there to answer any questions you might have about SAMS or to also take questions from you for our speakers. And next, I will be introducing our first uh, guest of the evening, Victoria Farida and Salam. She is known as the last female obstetrician from besieged East Aleppo at the famed M2 hospital, where she worked at the height of the bombardment in 2019. She's joining us tonight, live from Idlib, to give us an on-the-ground, first-hand perspective of the situation. It's my pleasure to introduce Dakota Sarita. Hi, everyone. How are you, Lara? I'm, I'm doing wonderful. It's such a pleasure to talk to you tonight. 
Thank you. I'll talk about the humanitarian situation in Idlib and the impact of uh, COVID-19 on the people in Idlib. Uh, the big problem of COVID-19 in Idlib that uh, that uh, the closed borders between us and between Turkey. There is many cases of people who have been died because of cancers. I know one patient who had a had a cancer. It was stage one, and during these two months, it was now the sta stage three. So now her case is too bad, and there is no way to go to Turkey. And there is also many cases of people who is dying because they they can't stay at home. People literally can't stay at home because if they stay at home, they will die of hunger. People had no resources. They had no 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 money to feed their families. If they stay at home, they will die of hunger. Also, that closed borders had uh, affected other people like us as doctors, because we, we didn't see our families in Turkey for, for two months. For me, I didn't see my daughter for, for six to seven days. And also the people in Idlib, if you told them that they should be at home, they don't have homes. They should be at their tents. And the lucky ones who had one tent for one family, there is many cases of people who had one tent for two or three families. So how could you tell them just to stay at your home or make a quarantine? So I think it's, it's too hard to make quarantine for these people in Idlib. Also, there is another bad situation for women in Idlib because I'm an OBGYN. Many of women in Idlib had uh, anemia. That anemia make their immunity too bad. If they had COVID-19, Many of them will die because their, their, their immune system is, is, is too weak. They can't, uh, they can't relate this, this, uh, this disease. Also, there is uh, many cases who had heartbreak, have, will make you to have heart broken. Yesterday, one patient who had came to the hospital, she had her child was dead because he was collapsed in a drain hole between these camps. They don't have drain system in the camps. So many of these children are dying during this, uh, between these camps. Also, there is another case that uh, people are now, they don't believe that this tiny virus could kill them because these people in Idlib had tried all, all kinds of death. They had been dead because of poor poverty, because of uh, shelling, because of they they lost all, everything. Many of people had less, lost their homes, they lost their jobs, they lost all the all their job and all their uh, life. So they just waiting for the death. Many of them told me, "Yes, we are waiting for COVID-19. So what? We are just waiting to die." Many of the people in Idlib because they are dying every day. They are trying to feed their families, but there is no resources. They are trying just to have a job, but there is no jobs for these people. And also, but Sam had helped us in our hospital that, you know, I had a night shift today. That we, in our hospital, in maternity hospital in Adana, we uh, make uh, many prevention guidelines in our hospital just to make this uh, medical mask. We also had uh, gloves for all the, uh, the, the medical staff and also we had the uh, training courses for all the medical staff and also we make all that prevention guidelines for every patient who had entered the hospital we measure their uh, temperature we uh, we just uh, th there is a tent in front of the door of the hospital uh, to screen the patients who uh, who are just uh, we suspect well, who are is suspected for covid-19 and just uh, to send them to make uh, the, the, the blood test in the, in the laboratory. There is many cases who had been uh, tested for COVID-19, but all the cases were negative, alhamdulillah. There is one case who is positive for COVID-19, it will be a catastrophe, because literally all the people in Idlib will be, will be infected, literally, because we can't just uh, make a quarantine in Idlib. We can't. It, if it was happened, if it's happened, it will be a disaster. Literally, it will be a disaster. So I, I hope uh, there will be no cases of COVID-19 in Idlib. And until now, there is no any case of uh, COVID-19 in Idlib. 
except of uh, eight or 10 cases in Afrin, but the Turks had encircled that area and everything was going in a good way and, there is a, 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 and it didn't spread to other area. But until now, I think the situation in Idlib for COVID-19, it's good. But the humanitarian situation is not good for the people in Idlib. Um, and uh, also for the women's situation in Idlib, there is many cases of women who had been uh, uh, cause of uh, lack of uh, hygienic uh, products for women in Idlib. Many, many of them had the urinary tract infections, who had... Uh, anemia and many of women are just dying because the medical uh, situation is too bad. In many hospitals they didn't have uh, ICU units and there are many cases they need blood, uh, blood products and there is a lack of blood products in uh, our area. Many of women, as I mentioned, many cases of old women who had cancers and they are dying. I, I know one patient I, I, I mentioned before and she's now is second stage of cancer and she's just just waiting to die. Uh, I, I hope the situation is going in, in a better way in the, in the future. But uh, for COVID-19 in Idlib, the situation until now is, is better than that in the US. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Farida. And we really appreciate you, especially joining us with the time difference um, tonight, so thank you so much, and for your for your ongoing heroism and efforts, you're you're an inspiration. Thank you. If you have any questions uh, for Dakota Farida, uh, please feel free to enter them into either the Q and A box or into the chat box on whichever channel that you're on, and our staff will help us to uh, pull those to ask her at the end of tonight's event. Next, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Muhammad Abrash. Uh, Dr. Abrash is a general surgeon and endoscopy specialist and another son of Aleppo. He's currently serving as director of SANS Idlib Central Hospital, and he joins us this evening to tell us more about the COVID-19 response on the ground in Idlib. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank uh, SANS, and I will be proud to say I am one of the SAMS staff working with SAMS since five years in the Central Hospital. Actually, we started as a field hospital in the city and we respond to many and many crises uh, happened in last uh, five years here in Egypt. Actually, the situa medical situation in Egypt is changing from time to time. Before a few months and before COVID-19, and the situation was regarding to the war that I think was very, and we are not able to face all the uh, cases come to the hotel, and we have stage of materials, shortage of medical supplies, and we have a lot of patients coming to the hospital, and there's shortage of doctors who can cope with a, this, a lot of patients coming to the hospital. After ceasefires and uh, this COVID-19 started, actually the situation is changing. Now we are not seeing this uh, war injuries. We are seeing that the people is coming with different uh, cases of uh, illness, like a few words, like uh, a shortage of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, some cases, which is we can, we can call it uh, cold cases, uh, and because I am a surgeon, you know, a surgeon, I can see different types of uh, like gallbladder uh, stones, like intestinal obstruction, like many cases which need uh, more intensive care. Uh, and we don't have enough uh, beds in our hospital. So that the, the COVID-19, if we are facing, and if we have these cases in uh, Italy city, it will be really uh, a crisis. In our hospital, we put two tents in front of the hospital for isolation, and we are checking everyone who's coming inside the hospital. We are uh, looking for it, and we have a connection with uh, the Ministry of uh, Health and Directory of Health, I mean, in Idlib, and uh, will be warned. And we are checking everyone coming to the, our hospital. 
so till now, uh, fortunately, we did not find any case taking the people and doing this uh, PCR in the laboratory in Italy. Uh, and uh, fortunately, till now, I told you there is no cases uh, positive till now. Uh, we are taking animal staff to all the protection by face mask and uh, hygiene and hand hygiene, everything uh, to to protect our staff and daily hygiene of the hospital and the OR OR and the patient rooms. Uh, for the people, they cannot believe that they will have, as Dr. Farida mentioned, they are not believing and they are not uh, feeling uh, fear of this COVID-19 because we say the, the, the this which more more heavy than this uh, illness. It is a virus we cannot see by our eyes, but we can see the shilling coming to us. We can see the plane, uh, the Russian and regime being coming to us and shilling our building, and the building is pulled down over the babies and children. Uh, for COVID-19, actually, really for the uh, newborn, if they will have any problem, if there is only about 20 uh, ICU beds for a newborn in all Idlib area, and it will not be enough. And the border now with Turkey is closed. Even me, I am since now two months is uh, in Idlib. I cannot go to my family in Turkey because the border is closed. And Turkey is not uh, have more medical uh, treatment in Turkey. So, and also we cannot receive any medical resources because we are using what we have in our stores. And if the, the, the situation would continue like this, maybe we will finish with the six months and it will be uh, empty and we will not find any uh, medication to give to the patient. Our, our hospital is receiving daily uh, about uh, 500 patients uh, in, OR, in uh, emergency room and uh, in OBD, and we are operating per month about 500 cases per month. I just finished my one operation when I uh, you can <clears throat> just I came out from OR and did my operation and now it, the time is very late in Syria we are it is the whole time already so really we are working very hard but we are proud to work we are not uh, feeling any tired we have to give service to our people and with support of SAMS we are ready to uh, uh, face any crisis in the future thank you Thank you so much, Dr. Abraj. It's such a pleasure to have you, Alayati Glafie. And thank you as well for being on with us so late with the time difference. We definitely appreciate thank it. Uh, I want to remind everybody again of our Stand with Idlib campaign. Uh, this is your opportunity to text Stand with Idlib to 71777, and you'll receive a uh, text with the link to find out more. If you'd like more information about SAM's work in general, you're welcome to visit the website at sams-usa.net. Next, it is my pleasure to introduce to you uh, one of our esteemed and generous donors, Lois Anderson. Lois is a retired nurse and has been a longtime donor and supporter of SAM. She currently resides in Minnesota, and she would like to say a few words about what inspires her to donate and support SAM. Welcome, Lois. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome to everyone who is a part of this webinar. Um, I am a retired public health nurse and I became aware of the war and suffering in Syria when I had a, a client, I visited a client in his home who had PTSD and had just come back from Syria. Fortunately, the county was able to help him with a personal care attendant, and that's the kind of person who can help with bathing and um, also transport sometimes and uh, help with cooking food and that kind of thing. So uh, I was glad that we were able to help him in that regards. But it was very touching for me to hear his story, and um, it was through him that I found out about SAMS. 
And I thought it was such a wonderful idea that people in the United States could help the medical people in Syria to give things like medicines and help them with all kinds of things they needed, whether it be medicine, equipment, or actually send doctors to Syria to assist with all the issues that, that are going there where, where they need so much assistance. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, so my heart goes out to the people of Syria. Um, I read about what's happening. I, I feel great um, frustration uh, of their lives and, and how hard their lives are. And, and I feel that the, the only thing, probably the only thing I can do is to contribute some money every month. So I donate monthly um, to Sam's and um, I get really nice feedback <laughs> about how they need the money and they're using the money. Um, they send out a newsletter so you can read about what they're doing. Um, you read about their doctors and the kind of help that the doctors are giving to the patients. And I'm just, I'm just totally con committed to SAMS and think it's a wonderful organization. And I would like to encourage any of you who have extra money to consider a donation. Even the $10 a month donation would be helpful. And I guess that's all I have to say except to thank all of you who are working with SAMS. And just keep up the good work, carry on. And those of us who, who can, will we'll keep up our good work on our end. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Lois, for You're your welcome. generosity, your kind words, and your support. It's, it's people like you that really encourage us to keep going. So Mufadda yeah. said before, it can get exhausting. We've been going at this for nine years. Yeah. And it's hearing words like that really are, are inspiring. It means so much. So thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Next, I would love to introduce you to one of our multi-medical mission volunteers, Dr. Martin Fogel. Uh, Dr. Fogel is a vascular surgeon and chief medical officer of Primacare Medical, medical Group excuse me, in Fall River, Massachusetts. He's joined SAMS on four medical missions to Jordan. And in fact, even though we don't live that far apart, Dr. Fogel, I think I've only met you in Jordan. <laughs> uh, he, he will share with us the impact that these medical missions have had on him and his perspective on how they impact the refugees as well. Dr. Fogel, welcome. Thank you. Ramadan Mubarak, and I thank Dr. Hamideh and the organizers for the chance to meet you all virtually as it must be, and for the chance to participate in this very special event. While I have the video floor, I hope to give you a five minute snapshot of my involvement with SAMS, describing how important SAMS has been to me, summarized into what I consider my three lessons learned. My career has involved uh, 30 years of vascular surgery, and more recently as a medical administrator in Massachusetts. I've been a member of SAMS for nearly four years, primarily as a physician traveling to Jordan, and I've gone to two of the international meetings. During surgical training, we're instructed that every day can be a school day. And what that means that every day presents an opportunity to learn something new. What's even more important, you soon realize that your teachers may not be professors in white coats, but may be your colleagues, your patients, and the setting where you work. So I'd like to share three critical lessons that I've learned during my four missions to Amman, which calculates out to about every nine months since 2017. Lesson one, what can one person possibly do to help? Problems, whether it's politics, weather, or viral pandemics, are unpredictable. They're larger than any one person, but the survival of individuals and communities ultimately depends on the actions of individuals. SAMS, to me, is a superb example of individual effort and individual generosity benefiting thousands of individuals across the globe. Lesson number two is gratitude. I'm grateful for the examples set by my amazing SAMS colleagues, for the lessons of dedication and selflessness that to an immensely important cause. 
my Sam's friendships first in person and then with the subsequent help of WhatsApp have lasted for years and have really shortened the distance between the US, the Middle East, Europe, South Africa, and Australia. I need to make it clear though that the physicians are only one part of that story, which also includes the SAMS staff in the States and the unbelievable staff in Jordan who make it happen day after day, evening after evening, and mission after mission. All right, lesson number three, people are people. I'm grateful to every patient I've seen in Zatri camp in Urbid and every other town clinic in Jordan who repeatedly reminded me of the simplest of lessons that children are children, families are families, regardless of the setting and regardless of the circumstances. For example, the 25 year old amputee with a frozen shoulder was a productive craftsman before the injury took his livelihood and took his family. What he needed is exactly what anyone would need and what Sam's tries to provide. A team of nurses, specialty physicians, therapists, and counselors. For those brief moments in that clinic, he was my patient and I was his hope for something better in his life. The 90 year old man that I met with diabetes and severe arterial disease could very well have been a 90 year old man in Massachusetts with the same sore foot. The point is that we're all more alike than we are different. Everyone is entitled to safety, respect, and medical care that every individual deserves. But for me, these are the lessons of SAMS. So SAMS and its many layers of devoted workers and supporters really are the medical lifeline for so many people in so many settings and I'm proud to have this chance to be part of it all. I'm looking forward to mission number five, even if I have to wear a mask to get there. I thank you all for this opportunity to share my story. Thank you so much, Dr. Fogel. And thank you as well for your inspiring leadership and for setting an example for all of us of what to look for and, and why we do what we do. So thank you again. Thank you. And a reminder for everybody who is interested in donating to visit our website, sams-usa.net, to learn more about our programs, including our medical missions and opportunities for that as, as that becomes safe for us to resume. I would like to also take this opportunity to shift gears and talk about SAMS's community outreach, including our COVID response here in the United States. To do that, I would like to invite Dr. Azuz back on our virtual stage to talk a little bit more about the COVID-19 response. Thank you, Lara. And thank you to everyone who has uh, shared with us so far their, uh, uh, their experience. Uh, as you can tell, every time yeah, you talk yeah. to people on the ground, it's uh, very touching. It is uh, very emotional. Uh, and you can see from our responders, and like Dr. Mufadad said, uh, uh, you know, this is just one way that we do so that we can feel that we're participating, but it's nothing like being on the ground. During the last uh, few weeks, we had a little taste of this with our corona uh, or COVID-19 response. If we want to divide our response, obviously SAMS is part of the healthcare system, whether it is in Syria, in the neighboring countries, but more importantly here in the US. We are an organization of Syrian American physicians. We are part of the American uh, medical uh, services. And if we are proud of anything, the most we are proud of, it is our physicians, our members that are on the front line. Uh, if you look at the states that were hardly hit, by COVID-19. There isn't a single state that you cannot count tens and hundreds of members of our organization that are in the ICUs, in the infectious disease boards, on the floors, in the clinic. And that is our, I think our major contribution. And here you see some of our members that are being played uh, on the ground in their full gear. Our response in the US has been led by Dr. Fatah Shaar and Dr. Arif al and included uh, trying to support uh, 
with uh, protection equipment, especially we've delivered uh, about 8,000 uh, N95 masks to different facilities in the hard hit states. We have delivered appreciation awards to the nurses and healthcare workers that, are, that have demonstrated uh, special uh, services and contributions during this crisis. We have held educational webinars. In uh, the region, in Jordan and Lebanon, we have been part of the national response to COVID-19. We have distributed and supported the efforts of the local ministries financially and with PPEs, in addition to being an integral part of the educational campaign, educating the public and healthcare workers in Jordan and in Lebanon. I'm most proud of our Arabic series mental health webinar that is geared towards the public in the region and non-English speaking uh, members here in the uh, our community in the US dealing with the mental health consequences of uh, COVID-19. But the more important response is obviously, as always, is our response in Syria, which as has been alluded to, and as anyone can imagine, is extremely difficult, is very, uh, almost impossible. It doesn't matter how much you do, it's not going to be important. The lesson we learned is that the most important issue when it comes to managing COVID-19, controlling COVID-19, is the simple things that we do, the washing hands, the social isolation, the social distancing, the uh, protecting the personal protection actions. Uh, well, this is, as Dr. Farida uh, and Dr. Abash told us, is impossible. So we know that if it starts in, uh, in the Northwest Syria or in any area in uh, Syria, it is going to be very difficult to control. But even though we have been an integral part in developing the international plan responding in Syria, including education campaigns, including PPEs, most importantly, educating physicians. When it comes to health services, we are part of kind of maneuvering and rehabilitating our facilities so that isolation techniques are better. We're creating a separate unit for handling the difficult cases with ventilators. But again, anything you do is not going to be enough. I will finish by saying our response is geared and mandated and influenced by the most important thing, which is protecting the infrastructure, the weak infrastructure of healthcare within the Northwest. If COVID-19 hits the Northwest, we cannot afford to lose any staff, nurse, physician, lab technician, respiratory therapist. That is the utmost important factor that all the policy is being geared towards so that it can protect and allow us to have a response for COVID-19, but more importantly, still be present and not have patients that Dr. Farida described suffer because of even less healthcare availability afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Azuz, for helping to set us up so that we can continue to talk about COVID-19 response. To do so, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Abdel Raza Al Shakaki. Uh, he is a pulmonary medicine and critical care physician practicing in Michigan. He's a SAMS member and on the front lines of the COVID-19 response. Here to share his perspective on the circumstances. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Shakaki. Thank you, Lara. Um, you're able to hear me? Yes. Yeah, All right. Uh, I, I thank you again uh, one more time. And my name is Abdul Razak Shakaki, and I'm a pulmonologist intensivist by training and by heart. I like what I do. And uh, I practice in Southeast Michigan area. As you know, this is one of the epicenters uh, for the COVID-19. Um, to start with, I'd like to talk about my relation with SAMS. SAMS was the main access for me when I first put a foot of ground here in this country. Uh, SAMS was the main coordinator uh, that connected me with my research center in the Cleveland Clinic and helped me establish a medical career in a country that I like to practice in. And since then, I've been trying to be involved and engaged in every local and international activities that SAMS deliver at the society level and at the uh, relief level as well. Uh, so my history with SAMS goes a long way back. Uh, I will talk a little bit about our experience here when we were hit hard with the, um, with the COVID-19 in, in Southeast Michigan. Actually, New York was ahead of us, but here I'm trying to give a glimpse about the numbers, if you can see on the slides that I'm sharing here. Um, uh, between March and April, we, we had a really tough time to deal with a huge load of cases every day. And we were having like a thousand to 2000 cases a day. 
And on the other side, you can see the mortality was very high and we were like losing 100 to more than 200 patients every day at one point. That tells you that put a lot of crunch and strain on the system that include the medical staff between doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists, pharmacists as well, janitors. Everyone was involved in that battle was, was struggling actually at one point, especially uh, during the last month we, when we're tired and fatigued. Um, so um, to, to be quite honest, uh, a lot of people talking about the, um, the medical staff as heroes, and I, I you know, fully agree with that statement, but even for the people staying at home, they are heroes and they are doing essential service to the community. Uh, we all witnessed the impact of um, the, the public when they abided by the rules and how we felt a lot of relief in the hospital, uh, especially in the last two weeks. Um, so we are all part of this and we all uh, were involved in flattening the curve. Um, among the other specialties, I think people who worked in ICU were, I think, among the one who's most stressed out for many reasons. And um, if I tell you one thing, uh, Lara and uh, my dear audience, we were struggling because we had an overwhelming load of cases that I mentioned earlier, and we had to make very difficult decisions on patients that, you know, sometimes we have to deprive them from mechanical ventilation, then we can give it to other people who have a higher chance. Uh, we had very um, tough time with um, lack of guidelines and like sh almost shooting in the dark. Uh, we were worried a lot about ourselves, our colleagues who were infected, and about our families because we want to protect our families as well. So uh, lack of the guidelines and, you know, the target was moving every day. It was rapidly changing. Every time we learn something about the virus, we learn the complete opposite the next day. Uh, we were going through a wide array of emotions every day. You go and help one patient and within, you know, um, 10, 15 minutes, you learn that there's two unexpected deaths happened on people who were doing well the day before. Uh, you know, a, a lot of people, they feel like we're seeing a lot of poker faces now. You know, we cannot tell if you're like happy inside, you're sad inside. Uh, we had no people to vent to because we are in the same, you know, um, game altogether. Everyone has a skin in the game. And if, if you complain to others, they will say, we, we've got enough, don't talk to us. Uh, we were concerned a lot with uh, PPE. In, in the hospitals. I know SAMS was smart when it came to that to provide as much support as they can when it comes to PPE uh, between New York and Michigan and some other epicenters. And uh, the most heartbreaking part of this is those patients, they go through that journey alone without their families, without their loved ones. And, um, and unfortunately, a lot of them died alone without families as well. So as doctors, besides providing medical care and supportive care, we were like all aspiring to see what we can do to help the families at least understand and walk them through this difficult times if we're not able to help the patients. Uh, so I, uh, one of the things, you know, there's a, you know, doom and gloom here, but there's uh, many good success stories. But when it comes to COVID, there's a different level of success uh, that I'd like to mention here, uh, one story of a young, person who came to us who was very sick. And that was during the early few weeks of COVID-19 where we were not really um, uh, cognizant about talking to family. We were like just busy trying to help the patient. A mother of this uh, 25 years old uh, boy who was critically ill, we could not help him. But the mother, she goes like, please, at least if you're not able to help him, help me come to see him. And you know, all the rules were very strict and solid that no one is allowed in the hospital. But we made a special case for this mother to help her uh, by bringing her to the hospital, give her the full gear and go and say bye-bye to her uh, young son who uh, that she lost within a week. And at the end, after we withdraw care on this young, young uh, uh, patient, uh, she goes, I totally understand the virus killed him, but you guys helped me big time. Uh, I owe you. So this, that was her statement. So we felt at least we can do things beyond just medical care to those patients and their families. Um, the last thing I want to say about SAMS, we, um, I was involved with the, uh, with the um, current committee here in Michigan chapter, uh, where they uh, started uh, many local programs to support uh, healthcare facilities by providing PPE as they can. Also, they uh, sponsored a lot of meals for the frontliners and healthcare workers. 
um, not to mention the WhatsApp groups, the task force uh, groups that kept going. Some of them I had to silent because they, some people working hard even in the middle of the night after, after midnight actually. Uh, and they're exchanging a lot of uh, essential and critical information that can help us at the career level and also at the community level. Um, so uh, SAMS is in, engaged and it will remain engaged as, as the uh, crisis uh, lasts. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, and thank you for your ongoing leadership um, and you, all the work that you've been doing there on the ground and helping us to understand the situation in Michigan. I will say being here in New York City at the so-called epicenter of the COVID pandemic, SAMS is able to donate 2,000 pieces of PE, PPE, including the very much needed and sought after N95 mask. Uh, we delivered meals to staff at four different area hospitals, and we were able to award 10 nurses uh, who went above and beyond uh, with awards of gratitude as well. So I'd personally like to say thank you on behalf of my own local chapter here, Tri-State, representing New York, New Jersey, and Southern Connecticut. Um, this is exactly why I'm so proud to be a part of this organization and to serve on SAM's board of directors. Uh, so thank you. Uh, for everybody that has made that possible. I also want to remind everybody, if you have questions for any of our panelists, please, I encourage you to type them into the chat or in the comments, uh, wherever you are, and we will do our best to address them uh, at the end of our presentation. Next, it is my privilege to introduce you to Sherry Roberts. Uh, she's an FNP who is um, coming in from Virginia. She is an emergency medicine first family nurse practitioner. She is a SAMS volunteer, and she's here to talk to us about her work and her experience on the front line of COVID-19 here in the U.S. Hello, welcome, Sherry. Blessing. Oh, thank you. Blessings to everyone during this Ramadan. So I'm Sherry Roberts, and I'm a family nurse practitioner. I work in Northern Virginia, D.C., Maryland area. We affectionately call it the the DMV area. So um, I work with a physician group. We staff several of the emergency departments in this area. Um, my emergency department predominantly has an underserved population of transient uh, workers, Medicaid, the indigent, the homeless population. So it's a very special community. Our department, as well as the entire hospital, has undergone a se severe paradigm shift in many different ways regarding PPE availability and reuse, the lack of scientific study for effective medication regimens for caring for COVID-19 patients, this increased risk to ourselves and our families with repeated exposure to the virus. Also, the virus seems to have very different presentations, and that makes initial screening very difficult, very challenging. Some patients will come in with just diffuse abdomen pain, others just a headache and fever, some with only chest pain and fatigue. So it can make that screening process a little more challenging and a little more risky, I think, as providers, that's a little scary. One of the other things that was touched on earlier, one of the tenets of being a nurse practitioner and most healthcare providers is giving care and compassion. And it's very difficult to do through five layers of PPE to show someone that you care while you're yelling through mask and trying to breathe yourself is, is very stressful uh, for both the patient and for uh, the provider. My, I, Still, we've been very lucky. Our healthcare system has been able to manage our surge. I think we're in our surge right about now. Our organization, although we had a gap in PPE, was able to pick that up rather quickly. Um, we're still diagnosing new cases and admitting severe cases that are failing home care. With that said, due to the increased length of the COVID-19 patients, the average length of stay is eight to 10 days, 16 days if they've been on a ventilator. And this creates a great challenge uh, for scarcity of bed space in all levels of care and for PPE supplies. So typically those patients will back up and stay in the emergency department. So all the area hospitals around us are filled to capacity and the emergency departments are boarding patients. We're also caring for uh, higher acuity non-COVID patients. People are delaying coming into the emergency department because of fear of being exposed to COVID. So you have a woman who has had chest pain for three days and didn't come in and wound up with a very significant heart attack and heart damage. 
we see a lot of emergent psychiatric patients who have been unable to see their providers or get their medications. Uh, a lot of domestic violence right now with people being stuck at home, uh, loss of jobs, uh, loss of income. So a lot of stressors there. I, I feel very fortunate that um, my work with NGO groups like SAMS really prepared me for working uh, in places with scarce resources. So I'm looking around and I'm noticing that a lot of my peers are struggling with, in the beginning, with the reusing of PPE and the scarcity of testing. And when you work with a group like SAMS and you've been in these austere environments where testing is non-existent or very, very rare, and supplies are always lacking, you feel a level of hubris to even complain. So I feel that um, that work with SANS really prepared me for an austere type condition here in the United States. I think this is the first time in my generation of healthcare providers in the United States to have this kind of scarcity of supplies. And you can see the strain on, on everyone around. Um, this is kind of an exceptional event. But again, I fall back on complaining about it when I've worked alongside doctors and nurses and healthcare providers on SAMS missions. It just seems very arrogant to even complain. Uh, I, my heart breaks when I think about the SAMS staff and refugee families. Not only are they facing their normal day-to-day -day problems and healthcare issues, but now they've got the COVID virus as well to deal with. I think, you know, moving forward, you know, for for the U.S. is that we have to establish a better plan and, and our hospitals need to, to really be able to manage a global crisis. But my heart always kind of goes back to SANS. Um, you know, we provide care for people who aren't just displaced from their homes, it's their community and their country. And they're the most vulnerable people in the world. And it's been our mission to provide care and respect and assistance. And I just want to make sure that as SAMS volunteers that we all remember, and hopefully our donors will remember that we've got to keep this momentum going. That has not changed. In fact, the needs of, of the group has only increased. Our families, these are sons and mothers and daughters, uh, you know, men, women, mothers, fathers, sons and daughters, rather, that all need our help and, and need protection, and we need to look out for them as this virus is bearing down on them as well. So. I feel very fortunate, and I think I have Sam's to blame for that. Thank you so much, Sherry, for sharing such an inspired perspective on this. And I think it's it's uh, it's perfect and fitting that it's 7 p.m. here on the East Coast, and I'm hearing in the background the cheering for the healthcare workers as you're talking about all of this. So it's, it's perfect timing and I really appreciate your perspective of talking beyond COVID and the impact of the virus itself, um, what else we might expect to see and, and the, the greater impact that would likely be lingering and ongoing and a, and a big thank you being that it's seven o'clock to everybody who has been on the front line such as yourself. Thank you so much for your sacrifice and your hard work. All right. Well, now, um, if anybody would like to learn more about SAMS's COVID response, both domestically and abroad, you can visit our website at sams-usa.net to learn more about all those ongoing efforts, as well as to learn how you can support in other ways, including membership. And if you are a healthcare provider, you're eligible for membership with SAMS. Uh, <clears throat> if you are not a healthcare provider, but you would like to also be um, to also support us, uh, you can join us as a friend of Sam. So learn more at the website and our staff is, will be providing that link for you as well. Next, it is my absolute privilege to be able to introduce to you a special message from a good friend of Sam's, Ambassador Kelly Kraft. Ambassador Kraft is a U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. She recently visited the Turkey-Syria border and met with Sam's doctors working in Syria, including our very own Dr. Farida. I'm Kelly Kraft, U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. I want to wish a Ramadan Kareem to all Muslims here today, including those who are observing this holy time of prayer, fasting, and reflection. In my own daily prayers, I lift up the Syrian people, some of whom I had the honor to meet this past March at the Turkey-Syria border. Their resilience and hope inspire me, but the reality is, is that they've had to face and they continue to face 
conditions no people should have to endure. For many, food has grown scarce, the fear of regime attacks ever so present. And in some parts of the country, medical supplies have been nearly cut in half. More than ever, Syrian people need our prayers. They need our support. That is why the United States has been fighting so hard for their safety and provision at the United Nations. It is also why we are very encouraged by the work of organizations that have gone to truly astonishing lengths to meet the people's needs of Syria, the most vulnerable people. Whether providing desperately needed food or essential medical services and supplies, ordinary men and women have taken it upon themselves to do extraordinary things on behalf of the Syrian people. And so this evening, I personally want to express my gratitude to those individuals, those women and men, these, especially the medical professionals who have chosen to provide life-saving aid and comfort to the Syrian people who continue to suffer under the Assad regime. We are all touched by their bravery, by the bravery of medical workers who put themselves in harm's way to save the lives of others. This work is vital. It is honorable. And I know the Syrian people will not forget it. Thank you so very much. And once again, I wish you a blessed Ramadan. And if you'd like to learn more about our impact in 2019, you can see our 2019 uh, impact numbers. Here's a brief summary. Visit the website for more information. Before we wrap up, I would like to take a few minutes to invite our panelists back up on our virtual sta stage to ask a few questions from our audience. So if everybody can turn their cameras back on, I have a few questions for you. I am going to uh, actually invite Dr. Um, Tamada to answer the first question. Uh, the question comes from us uh, from Dr. Uh, Martini. Front, and um, the question is: How many ventilators are currently available to the population of about four million residing in northwest Syria? Uh, I can answer that question. Uh, I think uh, in northwest we have um, ninety-five ventilators. 97% are occupied. That was up to about a week ago when we were able to gather another 30 ventilators uh, in one of the hospitals that to be specifically uh, be able to be prepared for COVID. We're hoping to get another 30 ventilators, but uh, overall, the number of ventilators are in very, very short supply. Uh, so uh, we're, we're hoping to have a one particular isolation unit that we're going to be able to uh, receive COVID patients there. We hope we won't need it, but that is what we have right now. In the Northeast, there are much less ventilators, uh, maybe uh, not more than about uh, 15 ventilators in the Northeast. Uh, Dr. Azur, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, it's just that, uh, like I said, within our current capacity, we're trying, we're building a unit uh, that includes ten ventilators, uh, but uh, uh, it's four million people. So, like Dr. Farida said, if the virus starts, uh, that's going to be a minimal support. So, but we do what we can. Uh, Dr. Abdesh, anything to add from your perspective on the ground? <clears throat> Actually, over here in the free area in Syria, in North Wars, really we are 4 million people. If this COVID-19 will start, we will start this COVID-19 here in our area. Actually, it will be a huge number of people die without any aid because if we have only 200, the private hospital and all other in those, we can provide 200 ventilators. We catch only 200 people. We have four million people. And in the camps, there's a lot of people. They are 
living a tent, more than 10 or 15 people living in a small area, a small area. So one will be infected, the other will be infected immediately. So <clears throat> really it will be a very, very uh, bad uh, situation. We cannot cope with this situation. We need thousands of ventilators. We need thousands of uh, medical people to give service to those people. Really, we are praying God to not have any care. And fortunately, now we don't have a case. God is protecting us. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Um, I'm, I'm going to direct this question um, to the sort of Farida and again to you, Dr. Mohammed. Um, and I'm, it's two parts. Um, one, uh, how many ICU and infectious disease specialists are there in the Northwest? And if you can speak to whether or not there is testing available. Uh, in all the area of uh, Northern Syria, about 4, 4 million people, it's about uh, 90. And uh, when I was in uh, Azaz in my uh, night shift, there is a child who had died. It was premature, uh, premature, and uh, it was and uh, and he dies before b before he could have uh, a unit uh, in a ventilator for premature uh, ventilator. He had died in front of our eyes. That's happening every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Doctor? Doctor Maybe Mubash, Dr. Mohammed uh, have, have uh, more information. Do you have any information on either the number of uh, physicians, uh, ICU specialists and infectious disease specialists, or on the availability of testing? Uh, the Turks had entered to us about uh, 900 uh, kits for testing the COVID-19, and until now they made about maybe 400 or 500 uh, tests and all of them was negative. That was in Edlib, in, uh, in the laboratory in Edlib. Pandemic. You can jump in. Abash, Dr. Abash comes in. So um, after the, as part of the overall response plan, we had a testing lab established in uh, the Northwest that is run by the E1 system, which is a system that was developed during the polio uh, response. Uh, the machines were there, three machines are there. Uh, the problem is not the machines, it's the kits. So far, we have secured mm. about 5,000 tests. Uh, we have performed about 400 so far on suspected cases, and thanks God, they all have been negative. But the total that is available is about 5,000, and 400 have been negative. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Do you have anything to elaborate on the number of specialists? Uh, so that is a main uh, issue. As you know, when it comes to physician staff in the Northwest, we're dealing with all this population and about 600 healthcare professionals uh, when it comes to physicians. Uh, some of those are obviously uh, critical care, but a small portion of those are critical care. So like we've done, and as I've mentioned, uh, adapting to the change, educating people, diversifying people's uh, uh, skills uh, is what is needed. Uh, the number of ICUs in the Northwest, uh, every facility has an ICU, but the number varies. Some facilities have like three beds, 10 beds. In general, you're talking about less than 100 beds, and they're all occupied. 96% of all ICU beds are occupied. An ICU bed does not mean a ventilator. So we have about three to 400 ICU beds, about 90 ventilators for that whole population. Uh, what, uh, as, as part of Sam's response, we are creating an, a COVID-specific unit, a unit that would only deal with positive COVID patients that need critical care or ventilators. It includes 20 beds, 10 of those have ventilators, and five recovery beds. Uh, that would be just so that you try as much as possible to isolate the COVID-19 positive patients from the general population, uh, knowing how contagious this is. But it is a very complex yeah. process that uh, only adds to its complexity, the lack of professionals. And uh, from our standpoint, SAMS is uh, uh, kind of in a unique position where we can, as we've seen in Aleppo, as we've seen in Ruta, as we've seen with Dama tap into our resources here in the U.S., people like Dr. Abdelazza, people like the people you've seen on the front lines here that will be able to guide our physicians on the ground so their 
they can perform duties that are beyond their training, beyond their specialties. So we've seen uh, surgeons doing critical care. We've seen medical students stepping up. And uh, let's hope that the disease will continue to be controlled, just like everyone said, if it spreads in Idlib, uh, we cannot really predict how bad it could be. And I want to just highlight the, you know, the education piece that you alluded to earlier, and, and that's something that we've been doing throughout the last many years, um, and extending that to now the COVID response. It sounds like we're using a lot of what we've learned here in the United States in preparation for on the ground in Syria. Um, I do have another question uh, to pose. Um, how do you... How do you spread the word and convince the population in Syria to stay at home, um, especially considering the economic burden and considering some of the, um, uh, the, the comfort level so for some people to be able to even stay at home? Um, I'm going to start with our team on the ground. Um, Victoria Ferida, would you like to comment on that? Just to convince Victoria, people you're to... Muted. To convince mm -hmm. people to stay at home. Thank you. There is no way to convince people to stay at home. First, they didn't see any case of uh, COVID-19 on the ground. And the second thing that they uh, should work to feed their, their families. In our area, that's uh, so vital. So they can't stay at home. Also, the third uh, reason that they don't have homes to stay at home. Thank you. That's the, the harsh reality of the, of the circumstance and I think speaks to the potential disaster if COVID were to spread in the area. So thank you very much. Well, I, those are all our questions that we had coming in. I want to say another big thank you to all the panelists. Uh, thank you, Dr. Azuz, Dr. Hamada, Dr. Abrash, Dr. Farida, Lois, Sherry, uh, Dr. al uh, Shakakli, uh, Dr. Fogel, uh, Jessica, um, and Jessica, and Michael, Suzanne, um, and Lubna behind the scenes, the staff that has been tremendous in putting all of this together. Um, a big thank you to everybody in the audience that has been listening and tuning in to our ongoing supporters. And we cannot do what we do without you and without your ability not only to donate, but also to spread the word and share what we here have been working on. Uh, I'd like to share with you um, our, Idlib, our Stand with Idlib campaign one last time. And I would like to remind you that if you're able to donate, please consider making a donation. You could text Stand with Idlib to 71777 and you'll receive information to donate. You'll receive a link to this website. You can also visit our website at sans-usa.net and our staff is happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, thank you again for joining us. Ramadan Mubarak. Have a wonderful weekend and good night.